All right, Team Buck, special treat for all of you today. The man himself, Ted Nugent, joins us. He is a rock superstar. He is also an avid outdoorsman, best-selling author, all-around freedom spreader, and lover of the good old U.S. of A. Mr. Ted Nugent, sir, thank you. Well, thank you, Buck, and a happy springtime to everybody in spite of this crazy, crazy world we're living in. Yeah, let's let's because I, I have so much I want to ask you about and and you're very kind to give us your time to philosophize a little bit about freedom. But first, let, let me just get your take on what are we doing right now as a country? I mean, we have people being told that they can't go into a playground with their wife and kid with no one else around. We're being told that you can't go to a a drive in church. You can't go to beaches, although they're starting to change that now. What happened? I, I thought I thought we were the, you know, give me liberty or give me death people or at least don't tread on me. Um, doesn't feel like that's the way a lot of the government's treating us these days. Well, you smell like truth, logic and common sense, just like me, Buck. But let me tell you, yeah, these are uh, uncharted territories we're uh, plunging into right now. But there's always going to be good, bad and ugly. And I like to focus on the good. And there's unlimited good to be focused on. Sure, there's a bunch of freaks out there that are violating their oath to the Constitution, forbidding people to go fishing, forbidding people to plant gardens. I mean, it really is like Planet of the Apes cuckoo's nest time. So those guilty parties know who they are. But the good is that I have a whole bunch of hunting buddies, a bunch of ranchers and farmers. I got military buddies, law enforcement, first responders, teachers, you know, the, the, the doctors and the nurses. And those of us that learn to be prepared and, and live the Boy Scout mantra of being prepared, we have always been cocked, locked, and ready to rock the Glock Dock. And we're helping those people who were dumbed down. And we'll, you know, the new national anthem for a segment of society is, meh. <laughs> and it breaks my heart. But again, that's the bad and the ugly. And the good, I believe, is now manifesting itself in these protests where we, the people, are experimenting in self-individual government. And we're raising hell with elected employees who have tread on us. So I, I don't just see a, a light at the end of the tunnel. I see a glaring, you know, I singer every day of my life because I'm surrounded, my band, my crew, my wife, my kids, my grandkids, my management, everybody in my life is so in the asset column that we will help those who have decided to be in the liability column. But I really believe there's a bunch of positive that we can cling to primarily that divine intervention brought this great non-presidential, non-politician to the uh, commander in chief uh, helm. So I'm feeling, I don't know if you've noticed, but I'm feeling pretty good about the whole thing in spite of the oath violations, the abuse of power, and the runaway corruption that is so glaringly identifiable now. So I think even the fence sitters are waking up that you're not allowed to sit on the fence. You have to defend the fence. Do you think that there's not only a, a change in the perception about one's individual preparation that's now necessary, but also are, are we going to see a whole lot more people really appreciate, you know, I, there's a lot of, you know, the, the, the America bumper sticker stuff you see out there, right? Freedom isn't free. And people who serve in the military, for example, they, they know what that means at a very deep and important level. But, you know, a lot of us come, you know, don't tread on me, the gads and flags and all this. Is there going to be a renewal of that emotional, spiritual bond between millions of Americans and what individual rights and freedom means as a result of some of the some of the craziness that we were just talking about before. You know, I'm the eternal optimist, and I hope and pray that that prognosis is accurate and it comes to fruition. That being said, again, Everybody I know is in the asset column. Everybody I know works their ass off to be productive and to be a benefit to their family and neighborhood and country. God, family, country, boy, that's radical. So I'm not so sure that the dumbing down of America, I mean, how do you not have enough toilet paper for a hurricane or a snowstorm or a ice? I mean, how do people get that so irresponsible? And again, that sheep battle cry that I just, you know, painfully shared with you a moment ago. Yes, they're going to wake up. I'm not sure how quick, but more importantly than that, Buck, is I'm going to, I'm going to really scold my fellow patriots. 
Those that believe in God, family, and country didn't vote in Michigan, and they allowed Hillary Clinton to become governor. Yes. For those that are in, <laughs> unsure of themselves, that would be uh, Gretchen Whitmer, who is Hillary Clinton. So I would like to think that we should just focus on the 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 constitutionalists amongst us and here's the battle cry vote damn it don't let the liberals win by you know organizing their voting blocks better than we do but we have a huntthevote.org huntthevote.org what we did in michigan wisconsin and pennsylvania we finally galvanized what i think is the ultimate uh, conservative uh, voting bloc in America. And those are licensed hunters and fishermen and trappers and outdoorsmen, conservationists that traditionally do not vote. I don't know if it's because it's the rut during November and they're in their tree stand, but embarrassingly and, and unforgivably, that huge army of conservative voters don't show up at the polls. So at huntthevote.org, we are galvanizing those people like we did in Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania in 2016, the top hunting states in the nation. And that may sound confusing to some people out there, but mark my words. There are tens of millions of hunting families in this country that don't vote. And then they show up in protest because the enemy got into the office of governor in Michigan, and that's damage control instead of just voting God, family, and country as quality control. So I'm hopeful that that untapped army that already agrees with the truth, logic, and common sense that you live by, that I live by, that they'll finally wield the ultimate weapon in the history of freedom, and that's the vote in America. What is the Ted Nugent assessment of the opponent for Donald Trump right now, uh, Joe Biden? Have you been seeing some of the the Bidenisms, which is, I think, the pleasant way that we refer to them? Have you seen some of this stuff? I mean, I'm I'm trying to, to work on a Biden impersonation that doesn't just sound like a ripoff of Mr. Magoo. But then I realize it's going to sound something like that because he does seem somewhat confused. Again, I I. I don't think liberals are the same species as you and I. They like, they're allergic to truth, logic, common sense, and the evidence that is otherwise inescapable. Just examine the history of abuse of power by Joe Biden. I mean, from the credit card scams to his, the Hunter Biden scams and all, I mean, just a, a lifetime of ripoff and, and deceit and abuse of power. And then watch him struggle to form a sentence and people actually go, yeah, that's my guy. Yeah, I want him to be the commander in chief. I mean, it's this amazing. is like an outtake of a bad Saturday Night Live spoof on just how stupid people can be. So again, I know that that ignorance and that apathy and that stupidity exists. But I hope the people that are, are not stupid and are not ignorant of how we got to this experiment in self-government, I just, you vote out there. Go to huntthevote.org and let's make sure all conservatives are registered and we vote God, family, country, constitution, freedom. Duh. Yeah. Now, how do you think the Trumpster has done so far? Okay, look, right now he's in the midst of the most challenging governing situation for any president. I, I think it's pretty fair to say since World War II. I don't think anything really, because you've got the, the infection, the virus, and the loss of life, and all the, all the fear and the panic, and you also have the essentially induced depression, right? I mean, this is a depression that the government has walked us into. It said, don't worry, we'll pull you out of it. Well, we'll see. But how has, the, how has Trump done up to and including uh, this challenge in your mind based on what the promise was from the campaign. I mean, you know, you're one of the few. I don't know if you like the term celebrity, but you're a celebrity. You're one of the few celebrities that has been supporting this guy from the beginning and still supports him all the way through. So you've obviously seen a lot of the crazy on the other side. H how do you think Trump is doing? Well, let me put it this way. And I think if we examine my following sentence that the evidence will gag you. 
Donald Trump is as close to Ted Nugent as you'll ever get in politics. He knows he's on the right course. He knows about logistics and responsibility and accountability. He knows about the Constitution, that it's a God-given guarantee of God-given individual rights that our founding fathers wrote down because we didn't believe in kings and emperors and despots and slave drivers, even though we had to get over that that embarrassing, horrific chapter. So my my card, my, what do you call it, a, 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 when you get a, 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 a rating in school, I don't remember because I wasn't paying attention in school. I never went to, I was too busy learning stuff. Yeah. When you give uh, Trump a rating, I give him an A plus just because if you're driving such clear and present idiots that crazy, that's gold in my world. I mean, I do not intentionally drive idiots crazy, but I just stand up for truth, logic, common sense, again, self-evident truth, you know, that I have the right to my choose my own religion. I have the right to have privacy in my home. I get to keep and bear arms, not just the king and his henchmen, punks, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I give uh, President Trump an A to A plus just for the fact that he is going into uncharted territory. He's like Lewis and Clark of politics right now with this pandemic and the abuse of the media that the the unbridled dishonesty and hate from the left. I, I mean, I deal with it. They call me a pedophile. They call me a draft dodger. They claim I diss the Native Americans. Lies, 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 because they can't debate me. They are incapable of debating me. And all you have to do is Google my different debates and watch me eat the face of the idiots that try to tell me that my truth, logic, and common sense ain't accurate. So I, I love President Trump and his team. I think he is burdened by some of the excess baggage of past administrations, but he is uh, he's uh, de-shackling that at a real rapid pace. And, and I pray for the man every day and his family. And I think he was sent here as a non-politician to represent we the people more accurately than any administration I can remember. We are in a dark time right now as a country because of this pandemic. But you're a guy who seems to be able to find the optimism in things, seem to find the silver lining pretty easily and, and certainly have a, 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 a spiritual and, a, and psychological resilience in the face of all this. So what are you going to say to people right now that are that are really worried that America is never going to be the same? Well, this may sound selfish, but it's just a big campfire that I'm humbled and honored to share every day. But go to my Facebook and listen to the millions of people who just reek of goodwill, decency, work ethic, a drive to be the best that they can be. This country is wall to wall spiritual samurai producers. I know these truck drivers and I know these ranchers, I know these beef producers and I know these agriculture czars. My God, their alarm clock goes off earlier than anybody's and they go to bed later than anybody. Those are my people, I call them blood brothers. And I share hunting campfires with them every year because we donate hunts with Uncle Ted because I'm so much fun and valuable for different military and children's charities. And I hang out with the most dedicated, down to earth, grounded, smart, dedicated, we the people working hard, playing hard families who donate a lot of money to these charities just to hang out with me and get some backstraps around the campfire. So I know the heart and soul of every strata of the human experience. Uh, I, I get a call every month, Buck, from Marcus Luttrell. I speak with Rob O'Neill and Gary O'Neill, the author of American Warrior. Uh, Bob Blevins, who served like 12 years in Vietnam and a bunch of, I actually shared a campfire, Buck, with a, a survival of the Bataan Death March and guys that were at Normandy and Iwo Jima. These guys have, think of this, Buck, how can my haters and critics possibly deter me when I am sought out by that that heroic level of humanity they seek out Uncle Ted because they hear me promoting the Second Amendment, unapologetic and unbridled. They hear me promote conservation and hunting, God, family, and they find me. They 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 find me somehow, and then they come and share a campfire with me, and I I I milk their knowledge and their their heartship heartbreaks and their hardships in in battle 
And I didn't serve officially in the military, but you know what I got behind me? And on the mantle over here, I got a bunch of purple hearts, Buck. Stop and think that I didn't earn them. I tried to resist, but when a Marine or a Navy SEAL puts a purple heart in your hand and says, I want you to have this. And over a more than 20 years, about 30 years, 40 years, they have given me these purple hearts and none of them knew each other. And they all said the same thing. I want you to take this, Uncle Ted, because you fight every day for what my buddies died for. They all said almost like it was scripted, but it isn't scripted because it's burned in their soul. And they know that I'm the only artist, the only celebrity, even though I'm just a deer hunter, um, that gets in the media and promotes God, family, country, freedom, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, the Ten Commandments, the Golden Rule, you know, all that really radical stuff. And so these old heroes seek out the goofy guitar player and give me their purple heart, and I'm supposed to listen to criticism from Michael Moore, who still hasn't discovered personal hygiene? I mean, my cocky factor is off the charts because of those guys. Ted Nugent, everybody. Ted, I want to come back in a second and do a lightning round with you, okay? And we're going to continue the conversation on some some fun stuff. All right. All right, we are back with the Motor City Madman himself, Ted Nugent, rock superstar, hunting, uh, I was going to say aficionado, but I, I think we have to go beyond aficionado. H- how would you self-describe, how would you self-identify as, as a hunter? Uh, uh, hi- highly, highly advanced, uh, semi-pro, where do you put yourself on the hunting scale? I'm like crazy horse with a machine gun. I'm like, I don't know, I'm like what Natty Bumpo and, and Daniel Boone and uh, Jeremiah Johnson wish they could be. I literally I literally hunt and fish and trap year round. I mean, I don't know if, I, I suppose I could qualify as an expert. I've never bought chicken. <laughs> I, only, I only kill the food that we eat and it's, it's the most pure, nutritious, delicious, exciting and challenging because I hunt with a bow and arrow 99% of the time. You were, you were essentially doing the carnivore diet before a bunch of CrossFit hipsters in New York and Los Angeles were doing the carnivore diet. I'm the organic czar. Everything in the Nugent household is organic. My wife, Shemaine, is the queen of the forest. She's got a new book out that is just phenomenal, really changing people's lives. But we've always been organic. That's what hunting, fishing, and trapping is. There's no petroleum in our our produce. Uh, I, I, I trap year-round, and I... I a tan hides and it's the ultimate gift to my grandkids and i sign some of these furs the raccoon and the coyote furs i autograph them and we donate them to fundraisers for charities and people pay thousands of dollars for a ted nugent coyote hide and by the way it's a renewable resource and if you want healthy air soil and water which gives healthy quality of life it's going to come from wildlife habitat only if it's balanced and that's what hunters fishermen and trappers do so the world so now- should say thank you uncle ted uh, well, we we do we do thank you. I I will tell you, you know, Ted, you know, just just so you know, I know you're talking to somebody that's a bit of a city slicker, you know, one of these guys. But I was at the age of 13 a licensed bow hunter in the state of New York. My dad, we grew up hunting, fishing, shooting guns out in nature. Used to go up to the the Boundary Waters in Minnesota, and then up in the Quitico National Park. Used to go up into the Adirondacks. Went, went fly fishing in Costa Rica, which was amazing, by the way. You know, all kinds of really, really cool stuff going up. And so we were exposed to the outdoors. I had one, I had one of those dads. Like, he was done on the uh, office floor, and he's like, let's grab the 12 gauges and go shoot some birds. So a little, a, a little more familiarity than, than one might think just by looking. I mean, right now, Ted's got, I can see him, and he, he's got the, the camo shirt on, and I look like I just rolled that off, a, you know, an extra from the Wolf of Wall Street or something here. But anyway, I, Ted, I, I also wanted to ask, because you're mentioning meat, food, the things that you've been hunting. If you only were allowed one, I mean, like, if this is the quote of your last meal, but I don't want it to be that dramatic. But if there's only one wild-caught protein that you could have, you're, you only got one, and you're, you're limited to that for a year, what would it be? It would be a white-tailed deer fawn backstrap. Now, when I say fawn, during the hunting season, the fawns are independent. They're already weaned and they're legal game. And there's nothing more delicious and nothing more beneficial to the herd than shooting the, the yearlings that were born that year. And the meat is candy, especially the way that I kill it, I clean it, I cook it, I age it. it 
I mean, Buck, if I cooked a meal of venison backstrap for you, you'd probably offer matrimony and I have to punch you. But our ag- our average meal is gold, Jerry. It's the best of the best. And how much how much bow hunting versus uh, versus rifle and shotgun would you say you do? I do 99% bow hunting. I have so many animals on our Michigan swamp and our Texas property that the animals are so smart. They don't like guitar players with sharp sticks. I kill somewhere about 100 to 115 deer a year and all but maybe three or four with the bow and arrow. I have to harvest a lot of does in the Michigan swamp and I have to harvest a lot here in Texas. And landowners choose our own bag limit, which is why we have the healthiest deer herd in the world. And I donate tons of pure venison to soup kitchens and homeless shelters every year. But I, I'm a, I'm a nice guy, but I'm not an idiot. I keep the back straps. And I, I kill almost all of them with the bow and arrow, but because they're so elusive, I have to kill a certain percentage. And so sometimes I pull out the sniper rifle. Yeah, and uh, I, I'm just, you know, as I'm sitting here thinking about bow hunting, I remember, and I did a fair amount of archery with my dad and my two brothers growing up. We, uh, we had grandparents at a house upstate, so that was that sort of city, you know, urban to rural connection and we had we had uh you know deer deer targets we had deer stands on the property we had deer targets and things set up and you know yeah the whole uh, uncle ted would have been very happy at the sexton uh, upstate upstate facility let me tell you but yeah uh, that's one of the reasons that i saluted you a moment ago that you led a hands-on conservation lifestyle that's hands-on that's down to earth that's the ultimate compliment grounded you were raised grounded and ultimately that means you were in touch with god's miraculous renewable creation and that gives you a sense of place in nature it forces us when we participate in god's tooth fang and claw sustainability we understand better where life comes from like the native peoples i mean that's why i reference cochise and crazy horse and sit and bull all the time in my music and in my writings is because that native culture so revered the spirit of the wild, food, clothing, shelter, medicine, weapons, tools, spirit, um, healing powers. Uh, So my hunting lifestyle that I'm attacked all the time for, which is another manifestation of cultural deprivation, but my hunting lifestyle is perfect environmentalism, and many people are waking up to that. Yeah, I was I was going to I want to ask about, uh, you know, on the on the bow hunting side, but real quick, you know, I just I remember when I was living in D.C. for a while, I was a swamp creature when I was working at the CIA before I was getting sent abroad to do stuff. And there was I think it was actually in Rock Creek Park, which is a park that extends right into into the downtown of D.C., as you may well know, they had to they had to harvest deer and there were all these D.C. liberal yuppie types who were like, this is appalling. Like, what will we do? And, and the people that actually know were saying, you don't understand. If you don't, they are starving to death and they're spreading disease among the herd. So they had to bring people outside. They couldn't find anyone who was a resident of D.C. They had to bring a professional hunter from the outside because otherwise. Anyway, so that, that's your point about conservation. I mean, I've seen this time and again play out. But, you know, bow hunting, there's such a a a skill set to it. I mean, I even remember learning about. Uh, you know, if you if you hit the animal in the lungs, you'll you'll find the blood pink with uh, with the bubbles in it, the heart and liver uh, or you know darker blood that's sort of deep purple blood. And, and that's important for tracking. Yeah, no, no. I, oh, yeah. I remember this. You know, Papa Sexton taught me well. You were what my makes, blood brother. Yes. Yeah. What what makes a great bow hunter? What makes somebody a really excellent and successful bow hunter? Uh, conscientious stealth definitive situational awareness because god created these animals to avoid people especially when they're carrying a bow and arrow and we are at such a disadvantage because the deer can hear and see and smell and sense changes in the the pulse of the air it's really a fascinating art form it's a, it's the ultimate samurai um forcefulness of using your gifts from god in the ultimate application. So to be a good bow hunter, you don't want to be like the Motor City Madman. You want to learn to calm down and shut up and sit still for many, many, many hours. Buck, I hunt every day. 
if I'm during when the ducks are coming in, I take the three amigos out and we duck hunt in the mornings, but I'll, I'll deer hunt in the afternoon. We'll squirrel hunt in the middle of the day. We got pheasants and woodcock and grouse and rabbits and we got turkey. We got sandhill cranes. By the way, Michigan, sandhill cranes, they're ribeyes in the sky. Michigan, here's you think it's nuts that Michigan won't allow you to plant a garden right now? Michigan will allow you to shoot the overpopulation of sandhill cranes, ribeye in the sky, but they won't allow you to eat them. That's immoral. Sandhill cranes, ribeye in the sky, delicious. I, I divert. But to be a great bow hunter or any bow hunter, even with a rifle or a shotgun or a handgun, a, a higher level of spiritual stealth is mandatory. Now you might bumble into one once in a while. Um, I never have, I've never bumbled into a deer. Uh, but if you dedicate yourself to that predator spirit, what like, like the Native Americans, the Aboriginal tribes of Africa who I've hunted with since 1978, you learn so much from these people who live down to earth, grounded in touch with nature. And I've learned from them and I'm pretty effective. I, I don't kill deer very often with my bow, but like I said, I hunt September, October, November, December, January, and February. And even a blind squirrel finds a nut once in a while. And I can shoot real good. I'm shooting a Matthews bow that I can, I can hit a heart on a deer out to 70 yards. If everything is perfect and, every, and I'm super tuned in, but ultimately, your goal, yeah. the, your if, goal you give me an EOTech site, Ted, and, uh, you know, may, maybe at 70 yards, I'll actually hit the deer. So I'm pretty impressed with a, you know, on a on a on a five five with a five five six and an EOTech. There's a decent chance at 70 yards. I hit the deer. But short of that, my friend, I don't know how you're hitting anything with a bow and arrow. 20 yards. 20 yards is the the battle cry for a bow hunter. But if you practice out to 100 like I do every day, those closer shots get a little bit easier. No, I'm just amazed that you could ever hit a deer at 70 yards. I mean, that's that's a level of skill that I I understand. That having fired enough bows at a, at a very amateur, very young level, a very you know very young age, uh, it's it's a whole different ball game from riflery. I'm just gonna say it, a whole different world. Well, Buck, let me insert here to our our listeners right now. Um, we're talking about the fun of archery, the mystical flight of the arrow, the hand-eye spirit coordination of the samurai archer, the origins of Zen, by the way, the samurai spirit comes from being one with the path of your life slash arrow. You can put that arrow where you want if you are totally focused and become Bruce Lee momentarily. But right now during this pandemic, I have turned down on my Facebook, by the way, Thank you, Facebookers. The Ted Nugent Facebookers are the greatest people that ever walked the earth. They're funny, funny, smart people. Archery, get yourself a real graceful bow and arrow. Go find one, even if it's an old longbow or recurve. But right now I have turned on so many people to the escape perfection of the mystical flight of the arrow. When you learn to hold that bow and grasp that spring, string, and draw back under your own power and envision the path of your spirit, you can put that arrow precisely in the bullseye or the pump station of a herbivore. And right now, Buck, mark my words. I know you respect your elders, but respect this. This is written in stone. When you become an archer, and you discover the form, you, you will naturally ergonomically align yourself with your hand, eye, spirit, right hand, left hand coordination. Everybody listen to, to Buck Sexton and Uncle Ted right now. When you get to full draw in archery, there's no pandemic, there's no hate, there's no Hillary Clinton, there's no Nancy Pelosi, there's no lying media, there's no negativity. I'm telling you, it takes you, I shot over a hundred arrows already this morning, and you can see that I'm not stumbling for syllables. I'm not trying to come up with a, a point of view. I live this stuff, and if you get a bow and arrow, even in your living room at 10 feet into a cardboard box full of pillows or paper, and you discover where you can put that arrow, you will become one with your gifts from God to apply to any endeavor and you will be better at that endeavor after just a couple days of archery mark my words remember i'm clean and sober for 71 years i've been bow hunting since i could well i was on a bow hunting trip in october of 1949 i was 10 months old 
and I've never missed a season since. That's why my music is so ferocious because I I understand the world. I understand the dynamic. I understand the spirit of the wild and I apply it to my guitar jamming collaboration with the world's greatest musician. Oh my God. Am I, okay, so thank I'm you working. thank you for the perfect transition that I was going to have to make or or else my audience was going to yell at me. Here I'm talking to Ted Nugent about Political philosophy, COVID-19, which is inescapable everywhere. A lot about hunting and bow hunting, which I think a lot of my audience will really appreciate. But you can't talk to the Motor City Madman and not talk a little bit about music and and culture today. Um, let's start with this, man. I mean, my, my parents, you know, there, there are a few areas of culture where your parents get to say, and a lot of people, and, you know, I'm, I'm in my late 30s. I think a lot of folks who are around my age would agree. Your parents get to say, you know, our music was just better than yours. And at least at least when they're talking about rock and roll, I know I, I really know very few people. You know, that, let's put aside, you know, hip hop and and techno and all this other stuff. When they're talking about rock and roll, I feel like there's really not much of an argument. So so the first question I have for you before I get to ask, you know, if you could play in any band and we're going to get into some of that fun stuff. What happened to rock and roll, Ted? Where is it? There's a number of there's a number of dynamics at play. First of all, the more spoiled we get, and this uh, this horrible condition we're in right now, where people are scrambling for basic survival, and again, that's just a I say lunatic fringe, but it's a lunatic segment, um, and they are learning some lessons. And I love the lunatic segment, but they do have to learn to be prepared and be more responsible. But as goes the softening and the dependency in our culture. You got these spoiled brats that never built a highway, they never built a home, they wouldn't know which end of a hammer to grab, they would never done anything independently except squawk and whine like a bunch of crybabies. And remember where, Buck, I'm gonna blow your mind, which I'm really good at. So why did Chuck Berry and Bo Diddley and Little Richard take what Howlin' Wolf and Muddy Waters and Mose Allison and Lightning Hopkins, those black authoritarians of the most vicious heartbreak in the history of the human experience, slavery? Why were they so emotional? Because they were enslaved. They were controlled by other men. Just think of this, the savagery of that heartbreak, the, the spiritual shackle that went with the metal shackles, and then emancipation proclamation, and they threw them off, and instead of the heartbreak and the, the torment of the blues and the, the gospel dreaming of freedom, now they had it, and Chuck Berry and Bo Diddley and Little Richard went, it sounds like this, and they went nuts with grinding rhythms and sexuality and 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 declaring their independence musically. And it so touched the inner soul of people who were already free that these guys were celebrated with such authority, such defiance, that it touched the defiant soul, which we're, we are defiant souls, Concord Bridge, um, Boston Tea Party, uh, Lansing protest, et cetera, et cetera. And so what Chuck Berry and Bo Diddley and Little Richard and Jerry Lee Lewis, and I'll let you tell him he's not black, but those rhythm and blues creators of this loud, abrasive, guitar-dominating I mean, my God, it was just a, an orgy of emotional outrage. And that was from that era where they unleashed it originally. And then over time, People got softer. People didn't have to work for a living. They, they squawked if they didn't get, you know, health care. They didn't care about their health, but they want someone else to pay for their health care. Dirt bags. Anyhow, so there was a defiant era that doesn't exist anymore. Now what are they squawking about? You got guys that owe hundreds of thousands of dollars for student loans, and they're drinking $6 cups of coffee, but they, they're yeah, well, in debt. Also, it, doesn't make the, any the, sense. So that's what happened to rock and roll. If you lose your balls and if you lose your spirit, you'll start playing this nonsense. It's all Saturday morning cartoon pablum. Now I'm going to force you in to give me some. I'm going to force you to, to make some tough choices here, Ted. All right. And, and I don't don't do what people do with these things where they start dodging. You know, no, no, no ducking, no weaving, you know, no bob and weave here. No I, 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 I want to know if you get to be lead guitarist for one night 
for one band or act, right? So, you know, it could be Elvis or it could be the Beatles or, you know, whoever. One night, one act, all time. What band or act? Who would it be? Living or dead? Living or dead? No question, James Brown. I'd want to stand wow. next to that man and those funky dogs because I played all that James Brown music. I didn't have any, I didn't play any white music. And in fact, even today, my music is so soulful. I'm like a funk brother in heat. Um, so James Brown, he's the God. He influenced everybody. There would be no Beatles or Stones or Yardbirds or Kinks or Who or anybody without James Brown because he taught us how to play tight. Boom. I mean, that's how we play. I got Jason Hartless on drums the world's greatest drummer, Greg Smith on bass guitar. They could both be in James Brown's band or the Beatles or the Stones or the Who or the Led Zeppelin. And my guys have always been the best in the world and James Brown imprinted on us. And I don't ever want to lose that. And are there any, are there any of the, of this, uh, when I say this generation of, of rock, uh, rock bands that are out there, I, I'm going to give, you know, I'm talking anything in the last 20 years, let's say. Is there anyone who at least strikes you as they're kind of they're kind of tapping into they're kind of tapping into the old school here? You know, any band that comes to mind, I mean, if the answer is no, it's no. It's, but there, is there anybody who's doing that at a level where you're like, I could have back in the day been right on stage with these guys and we would have vibed? Absolutely. You got everything Dave Grohl does is authentic. I really I miss the crescendo of guitar virtuosity in a solo section, which was always the peak of the best music. But everything Dave Grohl does is really authoritative. This Greta Van Fleet from Grand Rapids, Michigan, who would have thought they're the real McCoy. Um, even Green Day is politically deranged and, and, and communist as they are. Green Day play like sons of bitches, man. They really, really play. And even, again, I, I can't align myself with the left-wing, you know, socialist, communist politics of a lot of these bands. But if you listen to the uh, Chili Peppers with uh, Chad Smith on drums and Flea on bass, these guys are as good as any musicians that ever lived. And their music has has pulse and, 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 and piss and vinegar. So yeah, and even all the best bands in the world are still on the road. I mean, Sammy Hager's out there, he's incredible. Uh, ZZ Top is out there, Aerosmith is out there. There's killer, killer bands that are of, of, of yore. But I think Greta Van Fleet and I guess Green Day's old now too. So I don't think there's anything really new. Now, I must say my son, Rocco Winchester Nugent, he has blended, now dig this Buck, my son, Rocco Winchester Nugent, has blended everything from John Coltrane and Motown and James Brown into almost, I don't want to say the words, but I will, hip hop and uh, the other goofy music that I can't stomach. But because he gets some of these super soulful musicians in his music that he creates, my son Rocco is a brilliant artist and a creative adventurer on, on the keyboards and in vocals and melodies and, and, and sounds and noises. So I still respect and admire and enjoy some of this very eclectic music. But when I want music, I want a, I want to see some forehead veins popping. I want to see 12 tambourines broken per song like Mitch Ryder and the Detroit Wheels. And that's what uh, Jason and Greg and I do every song, every night, every tour. And I pray the pandemic is over so everybody heals, but I, I pray the pandemic is over so I can tour this summer. If I don't play my guitar, I might hurt somebody. In fact, if I play my guitar, I will hurt somebody. What what is the tour supposed to be so that the folks can know? Assuming that, and by the way, I, I do think that by by June, most states. My prediction, and this we'll see if I'm right or not. Most states will be allowing for you know businesses to be open, concerts, large gatherings. That I don't know, right? So we got to see. But let's hope. What's the tour going to be? Assuming that it's uh, that it's the all clear from from the authorities. Stop and think. Uh, I've been doing this since the 50s. I started with a great band called the Royal High Boys in Detroit, 1958. And then we had the Lourdes in, in 60 that we opened up for the Supremes and the Bull Brummels and Mitch Ryder, the Detroit Wheels. As, and the music was just a powerhouse. And then I started the Amboy Dukes in 65. But th last year, Buck, it's a miracle. 2019, it was called The Music Made Me Do It, named after my record last year. 
it was the best tour of my life. It was the tightest, most ferocious, fun music in the history. My guitar tone is just to die for what Jason and Greg do. But this year, we already have it booked. We had a bunch of sold out dates, July and August. And this tour was going to be called the greatest tour of my life. I can't say those words on your program, but it, I guarantee if we are unleashed in July and August, this will, the way the band sounds right now, the sound of my Gibson Birdlands, if I wasn't in this band, Buck, I'd buy a ticket to the front row every night because my guys are the best. So I pray that we hit the road in July and August. Mr. Ted Nugent, it was exactly as I had hoped for, I'd expected, get a chance to finally sit down and have a, have a real chat with you. Uh, so, Thank you so much for giving us your time. Thanks for standing for freedom. Keep doing what you're doing. Hey, if that concert's happening this summer, and you know, I, I, I'm, I'm coming. You got to tell me where I got to show up. I'm coming to the concert. You got to witness my band. You will dance like an absolute animal in a nonstop breeding ritual. Um, thank you for your time, Buck. And again, thank you for your truth, logic, and common sense celebration. You are the voice of the real Americans in the asset column of this country. So never give up, never back down. Everybody stay safe, healthy, well, secure, cocky, defiant, and hopeful. have not seen the final text of this bill, but what I can say is that if it matches up with what has been reported, I will not support this bill personally. I'm not speaking for a caucus, I'm not speaking for a delegation, I'm not speaking for anybody, but as the person who's representing the most impacted district in the country, my constituents are upset. My constituents were upset about the first package um, because it it is insulting to think that we can pass such a small amount of money in the context of not knowing when Congress is even going to reconvene and pass such a small amount of money, pat ourselves on the back and then leave town again. I am not here to support that. Yeah, like she doesn't want like the stuff that's not enough money to happen because she's too busy, quote, saying that she or this is the quote coming up that she, quote, loves to see it with the plummeting price of oil and the devastation that the oil industry is going through right now. Remember, she has an economics degree from BU, and she won a very fancy prize for a science fair when she was in high school. So she totally knows stuff and is, like, really smart. Probably the most social media famous Democrat politician in the country right now. I mean, just, you know, is able to do these live streams, these stream of consciousness, and just, just share all these thoughts. And, you know, the, the left is, is fascinating to me because... They will hold up people like AOC and Biden who aren't very bright, aren't very impressive, don't really know anything. And these are their these are their suggested leaders for us. And then they turn around and look at us like, how could you support Trump? We want to put the we want to put great leaders who are super smart forward. We're looking at them like, are you guys out of your minds? You're, you're really going to. You're going to shuffle old man Biden in front of us and think that this is inspiring. You're going to have us take economic advice from, you know, Che Guevara superfan AOC? Really? You think so? <laughs> Roll call time. But first, I just want to put out there to the audience that I told producer Mark that maybe I could start doing some hip hop, uh, hip hop rhymes for our sponsors and offer that up for some of our what we call live reads in the radio business. And producer Mark did not think that this would go over well. I just want to say, I'm not sure I agree with you, producer Mark. Uh, how could you not agree? Have you heard yourself rap? Maybe that's what it is. No, but how would I know if I'm good if I don't try? I can assure you, you are not good. You know, he's, you know, team, he doesn't have the faith. You know, he just doesn't have the faith. I, I feel like I'd probably, I think I'd be better than one would expect. And also, I want to remind everybody, please go to BuckSexton.com today. Uh, and, and check out, we've got stories up. Uh, we got a story on Tom Cotton and talking about China. We've got my analysis of the New York City subway system and how this is the COVID super spreader. We got all kind. We got Devin Nunes talking about how he wants those SOBs that went after him to go to jail. Great stories up, bucksexton.com. You can also find your nearest local radio station there or listen to the podcast there, which would be great. And producer Mark, when are we releasing the rest of the Nugent conversation again Thursday? I'll do it Thursday around 9 or 10 a.m. Eastern time. There we go. Great thing for you to listen to over the weekend. Uh, and those of you who are radio listeners and not podcast listeners, well, 
you know, you think of it as like the, the DVD extras. You got to sort of click on the, you know, when you're at the DVD, you got to click on the extras to watch them. You got to listen to the podcast for some of the extras from the show now. So great. You can go to BucksXon.com and we have the podcast up there, but also uh, you can subscribe on Spotify, on uh, Apple Podcasts, which I, well, do we know? Why do we not call it iTunes anymore? Why is that a they, thing? Because the iTunes store isn't a thing anymore. You don't buy music. You use Apple Music. So it's Apple Podcasts. Oh. It's the podcast app, if you will. But isn't there still a... Oh. I don't think the iTunes store exists anymore. Like, you can't just purchase a song. I mean, I still have iTunes on my phone. No, you don't. Don't I? That's Apple Music now. I mean, I, I just clicked on something that says iTunes store, my man. And I can download... You might not have op- updated your phone in years. Really? Huh. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. Learn something new every day. All right, roll call. I uh, hope you guys all enjoyed the Nugent interview. By the way, we, have, we got uh, James Altucher who will be joining later on in the week. We'll have a long chat with him. That will also be a podcast. We're going to talk about how life is changing because of this, what we're learning about life, and what life will be like going forward in the era of the pandemic. He's a, a very big think kind of guy, and I think we'll have a really great conversation. And I think we'll have a really great conversation with him. And don't forget the YouTube channel where all of this will also be. Producer Mark, where will the where, how does one find the YouTube channel? Oh, you go to youtube.com slash Buck Sexton. Listen to this guy. We gotta get this guy to start doing some live reads. You know, laying it down here. Laying it down. I might become the new voice guy. Yeah, there we go. Producer Mark. Be like, yeah. Listen to Buck. He's not perfect, but he's better than the other radio hosts. This is producer Mark. Out. He's better yeah. than everyone except Rush. No, I'll take it. I'll take it. I can't tell, say you're better than Rush yet. So I don't even say I'm better than exactly. Rush. Exactly. I mean, come on. It's like, it's like you come into the NBA, you say you're better than Jordan. It's like, whoa, whoa, come on, come on. Um, let me ask you this. Have you seen the Michael Jordan? Because I believe we're also going to have Clay, uh, Clay Travis on. So, I mean, we, we just rack and stack amazing guests these days. Clay Travis later on the week to talk to us about the Jordan documentary. Have you seen it? Yes. Uh, parts one and two came out Sunday on ESPN. It was fantastic. Everything is advertised. It was supposed to come out, I believe, in July. But because of the pandemic and no live sports, they moved it up to April. And uh, it was a dream come true. The highest rated documentary ever in ESPN history. Almost over 6 million people watched it live. Wow. Which is insane for a not live sporting event on ESPN. Yeah, I mean, I, I do feel like I, I did watch a lot of basketball. I'm going to tell you the truth, Bruce and Mark. I watched a lot of basketball probably from age 10 till about, you know, college. So maybe there's about an eight-year span there or so where I, wa- I watched the NBA, and I, I, so I was watching the NBA, and then I was also playing basketball video games, which reinforced, you know, you really got to know, you know, if you play enough sports video games, you know, like, the deep bench players, and, you know, you really, you really learn a lot about, about the different rosters and the teams and everything else, and, you know, the, the games got more and more sophisticated so that they had a pretty good representation of the players. Um, but I, the, the era when Michael Jordan was on the Bulls, I think you'd have to say, I, I think for most of us, that was probably the single greatest, uh, within my lifetime at least, the single greatest period in the NBA. I think in all time. I mean, six championships in, what, eight years or nine years, two three-peats, they're the best team ever. Nobody will ever beat them. Yeah, I remember the Knicks were kind of the scrappy, tough guy team, and they they tried to uh, to take the Bulls down a number of times in the Jordan era, and it just never they happened. They almost won the year that Jordan was playing baseball. Yeah. It, it just never happened. Uh, you know, Patrick Ewing, I know he's a great player, but I, I watched a lot of, I always remember the sports announcer too, it was always Patrick Ewing every time he would score. That's because I, I went to the garden a number of times to see it. And this is back in the day. Do you remember uh, the bomb squad? Was this way too early for you with Trent Tucker and uh, who's the guy? Oh, I'm forgetting his name right now. Oh, John Starks and oh, yeah, uh, then, Trent Tucker. Those teams, yeah. Yeah, 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 that 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 and Charles Oakley, and uh, and Anthony Mason, and I mean, I remember that era of the Knicks. They never had a true superstar, but they had a lot of grit. You know, they had a lot of fight. And Patrick Ewing was the closest thing they had to a superstar, and he just never really got he, he it done. He was a superstar. Yeah, I if mean, you put that team in a different era where Michael Jordan and the Bulls don't exist, they win championships. I don't know. It just always felt like if you're a seven footer, your your marquee move shouldn't be a fadeaway jump shot. I'm just gonna say it. You know, he, you haven't watched the NBA recently. Now that's normal. 
There's guys ah, that are 6'9", 6'10". That, that is six true. I did see. Shooting. Look, I went to see. Thankfully, I got it in before the you know sporting events were closed. I, I did go see one Knicks game in 2019. And I, I got to tell you, uh, it was like it was like a jump shooting exposition. Just everyone just take it. But like these guys are seven feet tall and can shoot. It's like if, it used to be if you were a seven footer and you could hit a free throw. Everyone was like, wow, look at that guy. You remember Shaq at the free throw line back at the day? Shaq? It was like, you know, he like picked up a ball in one hand and kind of threw it toward the rim. You know, he got more of a touch as he as he moved along. But he started out. I think he was like a 50% free throw shooter, which in the NBA is like unheard of. Uh, I mean, less no, than, he definitely less than that. It was less than that? What was yeah. it was like 30 or 40%? I, mean, I, I would have to look, but he was awful. Yeah, he was an awful free. But it was like, well, he's amazing and seven feet tall and can dunk every three seconds, so no one cared. Now you have these guys who are, I mean, you know, well, who's the guy? I mean, I, I actually saw him play. They, I, they call him the, the Greek, um, I can't remember his last oh, name. Oh, Giannis. But, yeah, Giannis. Blah, 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 Nobody blah, 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 knows how to say Greek his last name. name. Just yeah, go long, with Giannis. Anastasopoulos or something, right? I mean, but Giannis, that guy's like seven feet, seven feet tall and plays like a two guard would have in the in the nineties. Yeah, he, he got, has comparisons to Magic Johnson, who was also like six ten but played point guard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, it, it is it is a change game in that regard. But we'll have uh, Clay Travis on and. You know, also, I, I want to see if, if producer Mark has any has a question or two for Clay Travis. We'll see if he wants to ask him something. Well, I, we the sp- guests can't hear me. That's the only problem, Buck. Yeah, well, you can feed it to me, and I'll, I'll say okay. this is coming from producer Mark. I'll whisper you, into your ear. I'm a very, yeah, whisper into my ear like you like you do when we actually have a show to do. Like, hey, Buck, you got to do the show. I'm like, eh, I'm watching Netflix. Mark's like, eh, you got to do your show. I'm like, eh, okay, fine. All right, Stephen. Hello, sir. Hello, sir, to you. I hope you and those dear to you are keeping well and staying happy and healthy. I see you often on Fox News Channel. I've heard you on radio for years. Glad you now have your own well-deserved show. I'm impressed by you on so many levels. I don't mean to sound obsequious. You are erudite, eloquent, edifying, encouraging, and enlightening. I love alliterations. I cheer you on as God continues to use you in mighty ways. My prayers go out to you and yours. Well, Stephen, that is very, very kind. And I mean this I mean this from the bottom of my heart. They actually just made my day. That was like the nicest thing anyone said about me in a long time and it's meaningful and I try to do the absolute best show I can for this audience every day and it is you know it, it is what keeps me going right now um, doing this show doing the best job that I can I mean I'm, I'm either doing radio or preparing for radio or sleeping or eating a little too much but those are the things that that is my life right now there is nothing else so I'm trying to do every day bring the most I can so that when you all tune in and listen your time is well spent and you're you're getting a lot out of it. But also, you know, we, we bring that connection, that's that sense of of we are we are in the hut together. You know, that's why we've always called this a freedom hut. It's a it's be a very big hut considering we're now on 160 stations and in all. I think we're all on in pretty much in all 50 states. I mean, there might be a couple of states where we're not on a station officially, but we're close to it. Chesson, Mr. Buck, Captain Hare Swoop Sexton. Been a while, but still listening. Anyway, listen to Biden's latest rambling interview. I'm beginning to wonder if the Dems are going to pull some kind of weekend at Bernie situation, weekend at Biden's situation. Chesson, I mean, this is what I've I've taken the uh, the approach of uh, talking about. You know, El Cid, a similar idea. I mean, they're, they're just Biden is just the na- Biden is the vessel for the Democratic Party to defeat Trump. No one's expecting Biden to be impressive. No one's expecting him to do much of anything. He just has to show up and Democrats are going to do the rest for him. That, that's the point. That's the whole purpose of this. And I don't know if they'll be able to pull it off or not. I mean, there's a recent I think nationally Biden's up a few points on Trump in a recent poll I saw. But in the battleground states, Trump is up. And as we know, the battleground states are what really matters. So, yeah. Yeah. It's going to be close, my friends. It's going to be a close election telling you right now we're gonna it's gonna be a late night we in the freedom but we're gonna be up late on election night dave buck my son and husband live in nyc he is a manager at facebook and his husband is a commercial pilot they love living in the city but after doing their state and city taxes are moving to texas as soon as they can what will it take for the state and city government to stop driving young professionals away uh, Dave, they're just it's just not worth it, man, for people to be here. It's just not worth it um, in terms of the taxes and the, co- the cost of living and everything else. It's fine in your 20s if you're going to if you're going to. Uh, speaking of basketball, go hard in the paint, you know, if you're going to really get after it. And if you're going to be a 
single person that spends too much money on food and enjoys the nightlife here and is uh, engaged in a lot of that activity, then you could justify being here for a while. But to, to raise a, a family here and to build any real wealth for one's family, I don't mean to be rich. I just mean to build financial stability. Very, very tough here. Uh, I mean, the entry level in Manhattan, at least, uh, the entry level, and this is also true in a lot of parts of Brooklyn, probably even some parts of, of Queens now, too, that uh, you know, one-bedroom apartments go for well over a million dollars for a one-bedroom apartment. Think about that. A lot of you are living in you know, a, a three- or four-bedroom house, plenty of space. Maybe you got an acre or two, and that house is not costing a million dollars, right? I mean, we, we all know. You know a million dollars in most of the country will get you a big, a uh, big ass house, right, producer Mark? I mean, not unfortunately in New Jersey, even within striking distance of New York, it's not going to get you a big ass house, but you can get a house. Yeah, you can get a house here for a lot less than you can get a one bedroom apartment in Manhattan, but it's still high taxes. Yeah, it's still uh, high taxes. You know, it's expensive. still expensive. I was looking just for kicks last night. I was bored. Houses in Florida. My God, they're so cheap. Yeah, I know, Looks man. Great. I do the Freedom Hut, you know. It may, it, we, we may, uh, <laughs> it may be a whole. I've got some moving memory. boxes left. You know, we, we end up going down to Florida and uh, be, be very nice. You know, no state income tax. Think about that every year, what that's like. Uh, yeah, I, look, I, I think New York, I, I, it, it hurts me to say it because I lived here during the real, the real glory days of the city when it was the safest it ever was, the um, most beautiful, the most, and look, it's been through a lot, obviously 9-11 and now this. But I'm talking about in there was a there was a period there in between really from about 2003, 2004 until now, the city was really on it on just this this unbelievably uh, happy trajectory for a long time, getting just better and better, safer and safer, more just amazing food and activities and restaurants and development and growth. But I think now a lot of there's an article in the Wall Street Journal today saying a lot of people are leaving and they're not coming back. They're not coming back. They're going to move somewhere else. So that's why when I'm when I'm giving like shout outs all over there, I'm like, what's up? What's up? KLBJ Austin. What's up? Ninety three point seven FM in Denver. Uh, what's up? Uh, you know, just go down all of our stations. What's up? Sandy. Oh, San Diego. Oh, San Diego. That would be OK. I mean, it's California taxes. You know, but I yeah. love oh. let's go to the one place in the world that's more expensive than. New yeah, York. I know. That's the problem. But we love I love San Diego. I don't know. Maybe maybe someone in Team Buck has like a, you know, a guest house by the beach that they don't use very much. They could let us like set up shop for a little bit. You know what I mean? Just just for a little while. Just to see how it goes. Yeah, We'll do it for like a month. Yeah. Or or f- four. All right. More roll call coming. All right. Hey, Buck, listening from <laughs> here we go. I, it just comes up. I didn't even set this up this way from Freedom 93.7 in Denver, Colorado. I also use iHeart or your podcast when I'm on the road. Great, great, great interview with Jack Carr. Thanks for a little bit of diversion in these strange times. I'll be buying all three of his books and looking forward to the TV series. Been looking forward to a worthy successor to Vince Flynn. No offense to Kyle Mills, but Vince's plots and characters were his, not Kyle's. Keep up your awesome. Awesh- <laughs> Keep up your awesome show. There we go, Buck, the English. Hello to producer Mark. Delray Beach is a great place. I've had family there since 1910. Stay safe and shields high. Yeah, I, I've only been to Delray Beach once for one night. I was on a, I had a, you know, I was there with a date and we went to a dinner and I just love, I mean, just walked around. I just love that place. I just loved it. It was great. So, and producer Mark likes it too. I Maybe do. That's an option. I, I spent the same amount of time there and I loved it. Tallulah, stop that. Sorry, guys. I know you're hearing a little bit of behind the scenes here, but Tallulah is trying to dig a hole in my couch, you naughty little Frenchie. I'm going to make you wear a beret. She hates, producer Mark, she hates hats. She's fine with sweaters. We have fancy little sweaters for her because, you know, she's a Manhattan dog. But if you put a hat on her head, she will just, she'll like do somersaults until it comes off. Like she absolutely hates it. So that's one way to get her to. That's right, a little French beret so all the other dogs, all the other American dogs will make fun of you. All right, uh, let's see. Ian, hello, Buckman. Thanks for keeping the Freedom Hut safe and warm. Oh, but of course, but of course, monsieur. You know, I was wondering what kind of impact the global shutdown will have on the environment, i.e. positive climate change. 
I think it'd be rather comical if the environment benefits greatly, and that's the reason Libs start backing off the 12-year doomsday calendar. Shields high, brother man. Hey, Ian, I mean, unfortunately, I mean, I hear what you're saying. And yeah, there's a lot less pollution. I mean, I'll tell you this, the air in New York City right now, you open the window and, oh, it's like you're on a camping trip. It's crisp. It's clear. There's, it's, I, I had never had this experience before being in the middle of Manhattan, but without all the, without all the car fumes, and remember, it's carbon monoxide that cars are put in the air. It's not just the carbon dioxide. There's actual really bad stuff. Uh, the air is so much cleaner. It's, it's nice. But no, they're never going to turn the doomsday clock back because they want to control your life and they don't care what the facts are and, and all the rest of it. Dean writes, the Freedom Hut Quarantine Cookbook. Do it, Buck Sexton. I'll buy a 12-pack for Christmas gifts. Prepaid. It's getting a lot of likes. Uh, Dean, I'll think about it. Maybe I'll do a video for YouTube. If you all subscribe, youtube.com slash Buck Sexton, I'll start putting some Buck Cooks videos up. How about that deal, team? It's all free. Let's check it out. Let's see those signups go up. Until tomorrow, Shields High.